Okay, let's get into this and talk about it today. And I think I always try to take the time to guide you through, to give you the direction in which we're going and how it works. So let's first be definitive today concerning the Trinity. I mean, I'm just not going to throw stuff at you and then let you try to pan it out and figure it out. No, I'm going to break it down for you. And that's exactly what I'm doing first in order for you to understand what's going on in Revelation 1, 1 through 8, then you've got to also understand this thing about the Trinity. We believe in one living and true God who is the creator of heaven. This is not duckology. This is not uh, something I thought up or someone else thought up. This is the word of God. And so we believe in, uh, in one God who is the creator of heaven and earth, who is eternal, who is almighty, who is unchangeable, who is infinitely powerful, wise, just, and he is a holy God, isn't he? So remember Genesis 1.1, the writer tells us, in the beginning, God. So therefore, today you have one God. But you say, well, aren't there three persons in the triune of God, the trinity of God? Yes, they are. We believe that the one God eternally exists in three persons, the Father, the Son, and yes, the Holy Spirit or Holy Ghost. Now, yeah, I've heard people say, well, there must be four, Holy Ghost, Holy Spirit. No, 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 no. There's Holy Spirit and Holy Ghost. Those names are synonymous. They mean the same thing. And so, uh, and these three are in one God. They're co-equal, they're co-eternal, and have precisely the same uh, nature and attributes of each other. And they're worthy of precisely the same worship praise, honor, glory, and confidence, and obedience. Now, here's some scripture that will give evidence of that, because I back up what I say with God's word. Matthew 3, 16, also 17, Matthew 28, 19. Additionally, we find Mark 12 and 29. Additionally, we find John 1, 14, Acts 5, 3 and 4, 2 Corinthians 13, 14. I got an incoming call. You probably hear the buzz. Can't do anything about that. They should be watching the program, right? Sure. While I'm sure that this statement is some is totally, completely, absolutely, biblically accurate today, I also understand that it can be very uh, intimidating and sometimes very, very misunderstanding. So let's break it down. That's the best way that we can figure this out. The best way we can do this is to break it down into six smaller statements about the Trinity that's easier to understand. One, one God and one only. Secondly today, existing in three persons. That's Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Thirdly, they're equal and also they are eternal. Fourthly, worthy of equal praise and worship. Fifth, distinct yet acting in unity. And sixthly, constituting the one true God of the Bible. So, as you might imagine, the early church struggled really uh, mightily over this particular doctrine. And this is a doctrine of the Bible, of the Trinity. And they eventually reduced their belief in the Trinity in two short statements. And uh, they include that God is one in essence and three in person. So, Realizing this, when we say that these things, uh, in these things that we mean that the Father is God, the Son is God, and the Holy Spirit or the Holy Ghost is God, but they are not three gods, but only one God. Now, the Father is not the Son, the Son is not the Spirit, the Spirit is not the Father, but each is God individually, and yet they are together the one true God of the Bible. So have you ever seen the word Godhead and heard that word used? Well, theologians sometimes will use that term when they want you to refer or they want to refer to God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit as the three divine persons and basically in one God. So at this point, I really think that we should acknowledge the the chief objection today to the doctrine of the Trinity, and uh, which is that is uh, which is absurd. So sometimes uh, a denomination named the Jehovah's Witness they basically who pointedly deny the Trinity or the Triune God. 
They ridicule this with the equation of 1 plus 1 plus 1 equals 30. Well, friend, you can't equate it that way. You cannot refer to it that way. In their minds, Christian worship, Christians worship then three gods, not one. The answer is, I think, is quite simple today. The doctrine of the Trinity is not absurd in that it's what the Bible teaches and proclaims, and it's the evidence of the truth of God's Word. So furthermore, there's more than just one way to play with equations today. You could also say it in this way. One times one times one equals one. So the Trinity, let me give it to you in an explained version today. What exactly do we mean when we speak of the Trinity? Well, let's start with the negative and work towards the positive today. What we don't mean. First of all, Christians don't believe in three gods. That's not the case. Second, we don't believe that the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit are three forms of God like steam, water, ice. You understand, we don't believe that the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit are parts or pieces of God. So that would imply that Jesus is one-third God, the Father is one-third God, the Holy Spirit is one-third God, you would be surprised what people believe. I appreciate your comments, and I want you to also share what we're doing here today if you would be so kind to do that. So where, where do we find the, uh, the Trinity doctrine in the Bible? Where do we locate? You know, I would answer that, that the Trinity is taught in both the Old and the New Testament. So it's taught by implication in the Old and its direct statements concerning the Trinity in the new. And I know some of you are sitting there thinking, I'm going to get you. I've got you in just a moment here. I'm going to get you on that word Trinity. Well, for instance, the Bible contains numerous clear and concise statements regarding the unity of God. Deuteronomy chapter 6 and verse 4 tells us that the Lord is one. So 1 Corinthians 8 and 4 adds that there is no God but one. Well, there's evidence, not just one, that's two. First Timothy, here's a third one. First Timothy 2 and 5 explains that there is one God. All Christians hardly affirm this truth. If you're a Christian, you believe there's one God, but three persons in God, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. However, the Bible also contains, I believe, a clear and a concise statement regarding diversity within that unity of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Now consider this line of evidence today. All three persons, and I, I'm just giving you my argument, if you would. I had someone tell me one time, they said, you should have been a lawyer. You always map things out like you're giving evidence. Well, if that's what it takes to get you to believe God's word, then so be it. But I'm not, I'm not an attorney. Hallelujah. I'm a preacher. All three persons are called God in different places in the Bible. Let me give you three examples. Fathers refer to God and uh, Galatians chapter 1 and verse 1. Well, how about the, about the Son? How about John 20 and 28? How about the Spirit? Acts 5, 3, and 4. There's three examples there for you. How could the Son and the Spirit be called God unless, unless they somehow share in, in God's essence today? But if they share in God's essence, they are God alongside the Father. Well, the Trinity explained. Let's, let's go a little bit further with this. Where in the Bible do you find the word Trinity? And this was the gotcha that I thought some of you might be thinking. Well, I'll get him on that word because, you know, I read through all 66 books and I have not found the word Trinity in the Bible. And I'm going to tell you, you are 100% right. Man, give yourself an A on your report card. You've got that one right. But the word Trinity is not in the Bible. You are correct on that. Neither is the word inerrancy. But we don't, and also the word rapture is not in the Bible. But don't discard it simply because it is not found in the Bible in the 66 books. The issue is not the word. The issue today is the concept of what God says. So let's take rapture for an example. What does the word rapture mean? A sudden disappearing or removing. 
Well, you read 1 Thessalonians 4. You read 1 Corinthians 15. You read John 14. You read what uh, the Revelator said in Revelation 4 and 5. There are examples there of the concept of the rapture. The word rapture means a sudden snatching out. That's what rapture is. The church is taken out and we're taken into the presence of God. So the same thing with Trinity or triune. Trinity means what? Three. So this is one God, three persons contained in this one God. So we don't believe in the Trinity because of the word, but because of what God's word teaches us pertaining to God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. So is there another word that we could use? Yes, there is. Theologians, sometimes they speak of it as a triunity of God. It really matters not. The word trinity, triune, triunity. The fact is, it's not in the word, it's in God. And that's where they are found today. So this, it's a good word. All of these are good words. Even though it sounds odd, maybe to our hearing today, because it combines the two ideas of unity and diversity, uh, basically in one word. Now, let's move forward. We try to dissect and look at and put it under the spiritual microscope of God's word and understand the issue of Trinity. So moving forward, by definition, we have established what the Trinity is and what the Trinity means and what the Trinity does. Now, we go to Revelation. And we look at Revelation chapter 1, which basically is opening up the book of Revelation to you. But what is Revelation about? There again, I want to make my argument to you, or present to you rather, about what it is. So it's one, it's not revelations, it's no plural uh, to it, it's revelation, singular. And so for many of us, the book of Revelation is shrouded in a cloud of mystery, and sometimes we read it as if it was a book of signs and predictions for the future. It's God's word, and it's telling us what is happening, and we can surely see so much of the events that are taking place in our culture, society, and generation today that, is being, that has been brought to us in Matthew 24 and 25 and revealing about the end times and last days. Paul talked about it, that in the last days of it would be perilous times and all the issues that he dealt with. But Revelation, first today, Revelation shows us things Jesus means for us to see. Revelation 1, 1 through 2. So the book of Revelation is written by John, who is the writer of the gospel of John and also 1st, 2nd, 3rd John. And we realize that John was placed on the Isle of Patmos for the purpose of the Romans thought they placed him there in exile but God placed them there to give us the 22 chapters of what we have in the book of Revelation that we would today have hope in knowing that in these last days in which we are living where people are going ballistically crazy and losing their minds over things that we today have a peace and a surety and a steadfastness and a hope that we have in Christ. So in Revelation 1.1, there's no doubt about the, what the uh, book of Revelation is about. So we're told that the, basically that the contents of this book consist of revelation that belonged to Jesus. That's Revelation 1 1. And it was given to Jesus to show the servants the things which must soon take place. Revelation 1 1. And so these things will take place. It's going to be the uncovering, the revealing of Christ and his coming. So Jesus made as quote unquote the things known by sending his angel to the servant John in Revelation 1 1 and the B part of the verse. So he does it by sending his angel to John, who then bore witness, and that's important to know, he bore witness to the word of God and to the testimony of Jesus Christ, Revelation 1 and 2. So this is why John then meets angels again and again in the throughout the book of Revelation in the 22 chapters, we see he has these confrontations. The angel comes by the will and the purpose of Jesus Christ. And so right in the first verse, we see that the revelation comes from Jesus and then serves a defined, let's use the word specific purpose. Do you realize God has a purpose in everything that he does? And let me just sidebar this for a moment. And even the troubles and travails and problems and perplexities of life, 
God has a plan. Jesus has a plan in that to work all things together for your good. So what you thought was designed as a means of destruction, God uses as, as a means of deliverance and delight. So you can still delight in the Lord. So thus, we, if we uh, are on the receiving end, and today you've got to grasp the message and not lose it in what we're trying to receive from the pages of God's Word. So God gives us Scripture to help us to understand things which are to come. That's why we have these prophetic Scriptures in God's Word. So the focus then of quickness and nearness that is found in verses 1 through 3 is primarily on the inauguration of the prophetic fulfillment and its ongoing aspect today rather than the nearness of the consummate fulfillment the return of the Lord Jesus Christ through uh, though understanding that will happen. So that being the case, and we're getting to this issue about the triune here. So I'm just trying to pave the way here for you so that we can then culminate and come to that conclusion. What it means for us then is this, that instead of getting caught up in the predicting of things when they're going to happen, we are to read it as events today that are near to us and have a really happened or already happened uh, expression within our life. All right, that being the case, Revelation is meant then for the church obedience and for the blessing of the church. You can find that in verses 3 through 4. So when we read in Revelation 1 and 3, we read of the two types of people that are blessed. God has prepared today a wonderful blessing for the one who reads these words and also those who hear it. If you read the word, you will hear the word. You've got the third one, right? Then you'll be a doer of the word today. So the Bible also speaks of obedience. That's the obedience part is in the doing. So you can read it and today you can look at it and, and you can do all these things today but it does not serve the purpose until you act on it. You've got to do the word in your living every day. And you've got to cherish that word and use it in your life. We just, you know, we don't just download or apply God's word. We are to, here's a good word for you. We are to keep. We are to keep God's word. You keep it by living it. And you've got to learn to live God's word. Get out of complacency and relax Christianity and trying to get by and worried about gas and worried about all the other issues that we're facing today and getting on Facebook and ranting and carrying on and taking pictures. Listen, forget that junk. Friend, focus on what life is about. Focus and show your, your trust that you have in the Lord. All right, now we come down, we come down to the answers. Revelation is from a triune God, and, and it's basically, it's for his praise. That's verses 5 through 8. So in John's greeting in Revelation 1 through 4b up through 6, he also describes the members of the Trinity. The Father's described as the one today who is and who was and who is to come. So he's eternal. He is called Alpha and Omega. He has no beginning. He has no end. He's eternal. And so his God and Father, he is Jesus, God and Father too. And we see the relationship within the Trinity, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. So Jesus Christ then is the faithful witness, the firstborn of the dead and the ruler of the kings of the earth, verse 4b, who loves us and has freed us from from our sins and the guilt of sin. Thank God we can exchange the guilt of our sins for the grace of God. And it's by his blood that he made us today a, a kingdom priest. And he tells us and he talks about us being kings and priests in his kingdom today. Man, look what God's calling you today. Look who you are in Christ today. And realizing that he will come in the clouds and one glorious day we shall see him. So last but not least, the Holy Spirit is also, here he is, present and described as the seven spirits. It doesn't mean there are seven spirits of God. No, the number seven is a number of completion, right? Fulfillment. And so also 
It's before the throne with seven signifying a full and a complete spirit. So if the spirit is full and complete, that means that Jesus is full and complete. The father is full and complete. God is full and complete because today we have this God who's in three persons ministering and blessing and helping us today. What the significance today of the of the fleshing out of each member of these of the Trinity instead of just saying, you know, God. I'm glad we can say there's a Father, Son, and a Holy Spirit today. I'm glad that we have the Holy Ghost with us today. Each member has a different role. Each one has a different role as far as personality. And therefore, in this particular case, when we talk about peace, we are meant to today really bring to the point to think about the relationship and how that peace comes to us through the Godhead. So Jesus allows us peace with the Father, and he became the Prince of Peace and purchased our peace. And then the Holy Spirit brings us to a place of conviction that we can come into the family of God and be called children of God today. And so the Spirit of God applies it to our life that we then are set free, delivered, and we are children of the Most High God. Therefore, the work of the Trinity gives us a richer and it gives us a fuller picture and it really makes us realize who we have living within us today. John also brings the gospel to bear today identity, verses 5 through 7. So we are ones whom God loved and have been freed from our sins by his glorious blood, blood and we are now in his kingdom and today we are kings and priests today of our glorious and wonderful God. Now, understand today, of all the people in the world, he knows you and he knows me. And he has chosen to love us today. There's no person today that's outside the love of God. There is nothing you can do to keep God from loving you. I don't care what depths you go to, but I believe they as Christians, we don't want to go out and live sorry lifestyles that does not glorify God. What we really mean today is, We've got to resolve today to start living for God and praising God and serving God and being obedient to God and letting God work through us. So God is described, as I told you a moment ago, uh, in verse 8, as Alpha and Omega, the first and the last, the beginning and the end. So these two phrases basically signify God's authority over the beginning of history, the end of history, and everything in between. So thanks be to the Lord God Almighty, which was, which is, and which is to come, that we have the Father, we have the Son, and we have the Holy Spirit revealing, refreshing, and reviving the church with hope today. And